from Bitcoin, blockchain or distributed ledger technology to cryptocurrencies, tokens and initial coin offerings. It seems everyone involved has something to say, but can you really trust their advice? One man's had enough of weasel words and charlatans and is ready to give you impartial, independent analysis. With digestible blockchain bytes, ICO analysis and need-to-know news on cryptocurrencies, author, speaker, transparency and clarity advocate and award-winning software innovator, Barry James brings you Radio ICO. Hello, this is Barry James for ICO Radio again with Blockchain Bytes. And I'm really pleased to be with, um, and forgive me, uh, Gunther, for the pronunciation, uh, but Dr. Gunther de Bratz, the Panna of PwC, who's been uh, uh, one of the authors, is one of the authors of an ongoing series of reports. Uh, about ICOs and where that's going. Welcome. Hi, Barry. Thanks for having me. Uh, just give us the proper pronunciation, would you please? <laughs> so my name is Günther Dobraus. I'm, I'm a partner with PwC in, in Zurich, Switzerland, uh, and I'm leading PwC legal in Switzerland. Okay. So w- would you just uh, sketch out for us a little bit uh, your background kind of brought you to uh, the world of ICOs and blockchain, and uh, then we can talk a little bit about the report, perhaps. Of course, uh, with pleasure. So uh, I'm a lawyer by training, uh, obviously, uh, but uh, I also um, worked for a number of years in, in venture capital and, and hedge funds, and in particular, the venture part um, has shaped me for forever after, uh, I guess. Um, and, and out of this, I was, uh, was very close and, and remained so to uh, all things in terms of uh, technology innovation. And so when um, the Swiss Crypto Valley uh, happened around Souk, um, obviously, um, you know, a lot of my old contacts uh, from the venture times in, in, in the 90s and 2000s uh, resurfaced uh, around um, those uh, exciting new developments uh, in, in the blockchain and, and crypto sphere, be it as promoters, as innovators, or as investors. Um, and so uh, I personally, and, and we as a firm, um, got involved rather early on, and, and PwC as such, um, obviously, is very broadly uh, involved, and and my my team and myself at PwC DD uh, as well. And um, in particular, we've been very close from the get-go, so to speak, um, to the Crypto Valley Association, of which we are a founding member, uh, and uh, hence also the col- uh, collaboration on on the reports. Great. Okay. So. Um... Uh, you're now on the third iteration of uh, the ICO reports, and in the most recent one, um, uh, one of the uh, things that stood out to me, you know, was that it was very clearly saying that that I- ICOs have now gained uh, further momentum and, and are emer- emerging as a, a workable alternative form of crowdfunding. Um, so that's quite a strong statement um, or a strong acknowledgement. Could you talk to us a bit about the reports uh, and how you got, got here in terms of the arc of the reports and about you know, how you reached that conclusion? Right. Well, as I said, we've been uh, involved in this from pretty much the get-go. And then we have to remember it's, it's a very young industry if we even want to want to call that. So uh, ICOs are only a, a phenomenon of the, the past couple of years. Uh, even and the one thing we've seen and which is highlighted uh, and which clearly comes out of the numbers which we're presenting is that indeed they have gained momentum and and it's probably fair to say that the industry uh, is in the process of growing up. Uh, I wouldn't go as far as to say that it has already grown up, but it's it's clearly uh, advancing and and that can be seen in the numbers. So the number total number of, of ICOs um, uh, has increased uh, as well as the as the volumes raised. But what we are also seeing and what probably isn't so apparent from the pure numbers is that the quality of ICOs is changing. So where at the beginning um, a lot of uh, offerings were you know, not not to to berate that or to put that down, but we're we're largely based uh, white paper only. Uh, we're now seeing much more advanced offerings, so where we have real teams, first products in the market. So um, basically, offerings that that could also be funded by classical venture capital investment, 
uh, but who now sort of decide whether they want to pursue either the one or the other road or indeed hybrids thereof. So I think we, we haven't seen the end of this development, but we're clearly seeing a development um, which is clearly showing upwards. Yeah, uh, that's, that's really interesting. And, and what, what are the trends, if any, would you identify you know, as marks of that maturity? Well, on the one hand, uh, I said the, uh, the ICO companies are more advanced in terms of substance they're showing. So it's real teams, real products, um, also the transparency they're providing around that. Uh, not that previously uh, people actively tried to avoid that. It's just that quite often they didn't have to show so much, whereas now they're, they're really proud and happy to do so. Uh, and, and, you know, it sort of becomes almost institutional quality, not across the board, but uh, clearly in the segments we are focusing on. Okay, thank you. And um, kind of looking around the world, um, one of the co quotes that sort of, you know, I commented on in, in City AM in my column there, was you know you say the Switzerland stands out as the as the ICO capital? Could you talk a bit about that and you know place in the world and and maybe some of the other places in the world that you you see as prominent? Sure. Um, I mean, yeah, clearly Switzerland stands a bit out uh, within Europe. That is, um, and, and in particular when you look at the volumes and and compare that to the. Uh, to the size of the country, uh, which, which probably is the, the surprising element. The, the reason for that, uh, quite simply, uh, I would say, is that we started early uh, in this game. So some of the more prominent um, big ICOs took place here. And, and as a result of that, or a combination of, of factors, uh, a uh, workable ecosystem uh, has, has been created and has arisen, uh, which basically allows this, um, this to develop. But quite clearly, others uh, are catching up uh, as well. So when you when you compare uh, the um, sort of list uh, of leading ICO countries uh, between 2017 and 18, there is quite some movement in there, and we see um, new players uh, getting in into the game. And it's surprisingly or not surprisingly, um, typically smaller places like Malta, Gibraltar, um, Liechtenstein. Estonia uh, and so forth and then there still is is the big hubs and and quite clearly the US um, is is still one of the most important markets this is where it all started and it will always be important Singapore uh, quite important uh, as well but also and I should note that uh, the UK uh, also is growing uh, healthily yeah it's really um, quite marked isn't it the, the that uh, as you mentioned um, the smaller nations are uh, particularly uh, prominent, especially if you look at it proportionately. But they're, what, what, you know, they're, they're kind of punching well above their weight. Why do you think that is? Well, there, again, is a number of reasons, uh, I would assume. Uh, the one is, uh, it's not only the size, but it's also where they are and whether they are part of, say, the EU or not, uh, which then gives uh, a bit of uh, flexibility to create rules. And I believe uh, rules are very important. So one of the key drivers for Switzerland, again, and sorry for coming back to that, but that's, that's where I'm coming from and where I have most of the knowledge is, that we were able to provide uh, guidance and and uh, and workable rules because most of the uh, people pursuing an ICO, at least those um, who are doing it the right way, they are not trying to avoid regulation or they're not trying to uh, sort of go for light touch regulation. They're actually trying to to find rules which give them predictability and and uh, a certain level um, of certainty, which is important if you want to attract uh, investment and if you're in the game for for the long run. And that is. Uh, typically easier in smaller nations, which are not part, say, of, um, of structures like the EU, where the decision-making process is just a, a bit, well, less responsive, shall we say. Don't want to put down the EU by, by no means at all, but we just have to understand the dynamic. Uh, and so, obviously, if you had a framework to build on, like in Switzerland, which was more principles-based, which allowed you to respond to this totally new mechano and, and reality um, swiftly, that was helpful, or if you were starting a sort of greenfield, uh, as some places did, that, that is obviously then a lot easier than if you say the UK was a very well developed and uh, very sophisticated, layered and, and detailed um, regulation in place where it's not that easy, I would imagine, to fit this new thing into. 
uh, and obviously then you need to change, amend, adapt, um, and obviously you also need the political support to do so, which makes it a bit more complicated. But in essence, that's classical innovation theory playing out. Early adopters, first movers, that's usually the swift and the nimble ones, and it's, it's the speedboats, not the super tankers. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that uh, was really apparent um, going back quite some time now was when uh, I was interviewing uh, Nick Cowan, the MD of the Gibraltar Stock Exchange, with, with some of their kind of early announcements, is, you know, it, it, the, the fact that they have um, a set amount of autonomy, the ability to create a new clean from a from a clean sheet, a new set of um, uh, of regulations tailor made for the age, as it were, seem to um, be a, a sort of major advantage. Maybe even to the extent that um, you know, uh, traditionally, as in the age of the the dinosaurs, size really matters, you know. Um, um, uh, but moving forward, it, it actually uh, has become about intelligence and nimbleness. So it, is that a pattern that you see? Well, it's, it's difficult to generalize, but, uh, you know, the business of regulation and of rule setting is a difficult one. We, we are very swift to, to berate regulators and, you know, to criticize, uh, but we always underestimate how complicated it is, especially if you are up against the grown, sophisticated, uh, detailed reality. And, and uh, you know, there's on the one hand, you need to somehow um, fit that in with that. And on the other hand, uh, we must not forget there is also... Uh, the need not to treat uh, people in a different way. Uh, so again, you, you can't disadvantage the established players by, by creating new rules. Now we're seeing a lot of that um, happening now in the fintech space where, where people are creating sandboxes and sort of uh, special regimes. And quite often this then leads to sort of discussions whether this is fair vis-a-vis -vis the established players and if this is not giving unfair advantage. So there, there's a lot of... Um, find texture to that so yes i believe the bottom line is that it's a lot easier if you start in greenfield than brownfield so to speak but on the other hand uh you know in order for icos or, or anything really to work you need a working ecosystem and environment there is no point having the nicest rules and the most sophisticated regulatory legal framework available if there is no banks to work with, if there is no advisors to work with, if there is no talent available. So you can't just uh, sort of go to Coconut Island um, and, and sort of uh, start from scratch there without all of that in place. And, and again, not trying to blow, blow the, the trumpet of Switzerland here or of Singapore, but those are places where a lot of the key parts that constitute such an ecosystem are available, readily available, and have been developed since. And it's, I believe it's a combination of the two things. It's the availability, or three things really, it's the availability uh, of, of rules. It's, um, it's a regulator who is strict, who has recognition uh, in the world, but is also sort of open to discuss because quite often you need to make case by case decisions in such a fast moving new environment. And certainly, and probably most importantly, is a working ecosystem. Yeah, it's really interesting, isn't it? Um, part of my personal career in history um, is, is uh, being to uh, ask some challenging questions around regulation and regulators, of course, in that, um, uh, well, actually going back to 2012, uh, August of 2012, I, you know, I first wrote an article really saying that um, the time had come when we needed... Um, an innovation unit within the regulation. Of course, everyone laughed at that, that point because no one thought that was uh, something that was even, you know, a shot on the table. And now, of course, in the UK, we, we have an innovation unit. Out of that has come sandboxes. That, as you know, is being emulated elsewhere. So um, it seems to me that, first of all, um, I don't think anyone would say this is an easy job. <laughs> um, but uh, it, it's yet to fully uh, take advantage or leverage new technology, not least um, blockchain technology. Uh, and um, so I'd, I'd, I'd appreciate your comments on that, but just to pick one other comment up, you know, the, the need to treat people equally. Um, 
I, I think that, that that needs to be tempered somewhat because I, I, in the sense that, well, actually what the regulations there for is to catch the people who are misbehaving and treat them very unequally. Um, uh, and, um, uh, and, and also um, the, you know, uh, when, when we come to look at participants in the market, people are offering services. And, and I think this has changed a bit, hasn't it? Um, you know, the way that you would treat uh, a major multinational bank and the, uh, and the things that you can expect of a major multinational bank uh, are very different from those that you could expect or the way you should treat a, a, um, a, a fintech startup. I'm sorry about the, 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 the length of the double-headed yeah. question, but I'd be really interested in your thoughts. Yeah, I think it's an interesting question. And, and obviously, uh, yeah, it's a very difficult one because there is no, no right and no wrong. On the one hand, uh, there is the need to treat players the same way if they're conducting the same business. This is this idea of uh, same business, same rules. Uh, and then, yes, you can make a conscious decision to... Uh, um, you know, uh, have some more leniency on, on certain aspects uh, when, when they are smaller because the risk profile uh, is smaller. So uh, I believe, you know, uh, the regulators uh, on the one hand are there to create rules, but on the other hand, they're there to enforce them and then they have to enforce them in a predictable and in a reliable way. And that is coming at the end of the day down to uh, same business, same rules. And, and I believe that's one of the core ideas in particular also of the EU, which then is then um, sort of the basis for passporting uh, and all of that. But when we are in, in, a, in a totally new sphere, where we are where we are venturing into a terra incognita if you, if you like then obviously you need a dynamic development of that and, and then you need to define where's the threshold where uh, the risk profile of such activity goes up so that the other uh, then a higher ranked um, duty i.e the protection of the market the investors the stability and the reputation of marketplaces um, uh, then takes precedence and where you then need to draw the line so you know you, you quoted the sandboxes usually they are sort of uh, allowing you to do little things but only to a certain level and once you go above that uh, then then things change um, anyway I, I believe that the, the biggest challenge right now which we're seeing is that you know for for almost decades uh, the business is such uh, the financial services business in particular has developed sort of linearly and, and now we are seeing sort of you know based on those um, exponential technologies exponential jumps and then we're, we're seeing totally new opportunities and and um, and and, um, and and business models and, and players are entering the arena and and in some parts the old models uh, just don't cut it anymore. So yes, you need to come up with uh, with uh, new rules and and you know that that is not that easy. But again, you know I, I I'm a chronic uh, optimist if you like chronic optimist, and and I'm quite proud of what's happening in Europe. Uh, because uh, in, in this game, I feel that Europe has become uh, pretty much a thought leader when you look what the uh, European Union is doing, you know, blockchain resolution, fintech action plan, uh, and also on national level. Uh, you, you cited the initiatives in, in the UK with the Sandbox, which was one of the first ones, um, and, and similar developments then followed in, in other jurisdictions. So I believe people are trying to do the right thing, and the mindset has changed because post-financial crisis, the regulation that was introduced was uh, sort of coming from a different angle and rightly so it was all about you know correcting things that uh, sort of have surfaced as a result of the financial crisis uh, and then sort of bring new rules to protect uh, investors uh, and stability and so forth whereas now that this seems to be under control we are seeing an openness to create uh, new rules to allow new business to think about capital market union uh, in the EU, which tries to unlock the in innovation potential, or PSD2, which is the first regulation that really required, uh, if you like, uh, or demanded that fintech players are being allowed uh, to play. Uh, and they're sort of uh, by force opening up the access to the holy grail, i.e. client data, uh, if clients so wish. Uh, and then we have, you know, blockchain observatories, uh, crypto um, currency observatories that were installed. So I'm I'm quite happy about seeing that, and you know, seeing this combination of regulators taking their role very serious, but at the same time being open uh, to to the new. Yeah, 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 and and uh, that's a that's a good trend, and uh, which in my view has a, a a way to go. Yeah, you see something really interesting there, though. 
um, uh, before we kind of move on to the territory, perhaps. But, you know, that, that it's unusual that, that regulators have this particularly difficult job. And part of that is they, they make the rules and they apply them um, to the extent that, in many ways, the sort of judge, jury, executioner and police all in one go, all in one place, uh, all in one decision making body. Uh, we've kind of, as a Western civilization, rejected that in other areas. Is it, is it healthy? Well, I'm not entirely sure if, uh, as a lawyer, I can actually uh, agree with that. I think it's a bit uh, simplified view, uh, mm -hmm. to be honest. And obviously, it depends on where you are, because uh, usually regulators are not making the rules. There's usually parliament and so forth uh, involved representing the people um, who have to create the actual, actual law. Uh, and then it's more the practice and the application uh, and the policing uh, of those rules, which is then uh, delegated to the regulators. But it's, it's a combination uh, of players coming uh, coming together, and again, you know, there's there's a huge variety of how it happens uh, across the world. But when I look again at Switzerland, which obviously is a bit of an extreme case, because we have this uh, very strong direct democracy, which interestingly uh, I believe is also one of the key reasons why Switzerland has become such a uh, important force in in the context of of uh, blockchain and, and cryptocurrencies. Because if you like decentralization and and consensus is built into our uh, or DNA, but um, when you look at how rules are, are created there, you know, uh, how it goes through Parliament and also the preparation before it enters uh, the parliamentary process, there's uh, a lot of coming together of experts, of representatives of, um, you know, the entire ecosystem, if you like, and then everybody can have their say and their input. So it's, it's pretty much a bottom-up meeting, a top-down uh, approach, which then usually leads to, to lasting solutions, which are sort of embraced by the people because they have their say in there. And to some degree, this is also what we're seeing in other territories and that's the workable solutions. But anyway, uh, this is a, a very lawyer geeky discussion, uh, yeah. <laughs> probably yeah. in the interest of time and of, uh, of your audience, we shouldn't go down that, uh, that road um, too far. Uh, yeah. Uh, again. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think it's really interesting. Uh, and, and, uh, you know, for, for, for everyone in many ways, but uh, so, just to kind of round that out, um, you, you know, clearly one of the things that's incredibly helpful in Switzerland is um, you have a pretty advanced um, uh, view uh, and, and taxonomy can, compared to other areas in terms of the, you know, the, the different types of tokens. Uh, would you just briefly take us through that, the, the different, um, you know, the different flavors, if you like? Uh, and, and comment on uh, what I was just saying, really, you know, how important is, has that been and is that in, in um, uh, you know, in the success that you've had as a, as a region? <clears throat> yeah, uh, with pleasure. Um, indeed, uh, as I said before, uh, I believe um, regulation is a strategic dimension and, and without clear rules, it's very difficult uh, to develop anything really because in, in a purely technology-based environment uh, you have that concept of the dominant design which defines who wins in the market you know at the beginning of an innovation there's a lot of uh, people trying many many things until at one point the dominant design arises and everything gets consolidated upwards uh, once that is uh, firmly established now once you enter the realm of the financial services world that dynamic is still there but it's um, slightly um, tampered with if you like because uh the trigger point is not so much the technology as such but the regulation um and um you know with with that in mind uh, i believe workable rules are very important now since we have established that this is a, a very new thing which doesn't properly fit into the original you know sort of framework which which we've inherited from from past decades in many a place it was necessary to come up with new rules and, uh, and i believe that our regulator again in strong collaboration and uh, or at least thought exchange with with industry has come up with a good framework and if you look at the um uh, at FINMA's uh, token classification again uh, it is uh, sort of representative of two things I said and the one is it's still principles based which allows to look at things on a case-by-case -case basis which I believe is necessary because trust me I've seen many ICOs but I've never seen two that were the same uh, or even closely alike so everyone is different it's like I, uh, you know, uh, one of my cousins is a dentist and he always says he has never in his life seen two similar teeth. Um, and so I think the same is true for ICOs. 
So in each case, you need to look at the fundamentals of that, but uh, it still uh, provides a sort of uh, a grid which allows you to maneuver in. And basically, we have three core categories, and that's uh, payment tokens, if you like. So that's the classical cryptocurrencies uh, to to pay with. We have uh, asset tokens which then are security tokens or other but what's largely classified uh, as, uh, as security tokens where then again you need to look under the under the hood uh, and then look at the actual features of that so some have more bond type uh, features others are more dividends based um, and, and and so forth and then we have the utility tokens which is what originally everybody was sort of um, trying to get to or or to uh, sort of promote uh, that they are because uh, it triggers the the least regulatory requirements. Yeah, and there's different requirements uh, attached to uh, to each classification. Um, now, to your to your question of uh, what we see, uh, well, we obviously don't see that many new currencies slash uh, payment tokens uh, spring up. It's still happening. It's still there, but it's it's. Uh, not that huge, um, and uh, we're seeing very few true utility tokens. And uh, I think that sort of resonates a bit with the SEC's view. Now, I'm not trying to get into the political thing, and then obviously there's this framework of U.S. securities regulation and so forth, which is closely linked to that statement. But uh, the reality is, uh, even with what we are seeing uh, here, uh, most tokens are hybrids. So yes, they have a utility component, but quite often they also have other uh, components as well, which then make them a hybrid, triggering uh, different or combinations uh, of requirements. And, and one practical aspect, uh, I believe, uh, which is very important and which is often overlooked, which also has in practice been developed by FINMA, our regulator, and rightly and correctly so, is that if you do provide a utility token, uh, or if if you you know want to have an offering that is that is a utility, uh, you have to be able to provide and make accessible that utility to your ecosystem within reasonable time. And reasonable time, in my experience, uh, means a couple of months post ICO. So if you're starting from scratch, and if it's going to take eight long time to create and establish that, then probably uh, pursuing a utility token uh, route is difficult um, and should be reconsidered. And hence, as a consequence of all of that, I would say, but obviously I don't have visibility of the whole market, uh, that the vast majority right now of what we are seeing is asset tokens slash security tokens uh, or, or hybrids. Yeah, really interesting. And, uh, you know, w one, I'm taking from what you're, you're saying that, oh, there are relatively few and many, even if they're trying to be utility tokens, you know, may stray into other areas and be captured. Um, but there, there are at least some that you're recognizing as utility tokens. Yeah, um, I mean, there are, clearly. Yeah. Uh, um, I, and I the Swiss from, rules. Huh? Yeah, and I, I think uh, from my personal background, um, I, and I'm not entirely alone in this, of course. Um, but I, you know, you know, thinking in terms of crowdfunding and mm. of the creation of products and services we as the crowd want, I'm perfectly content to be putting relatively small uh, sums of money into something that is going to take six months, maybe even twelve months or more, to uh, to mature, to, to to come into place, to challenge incumbents. Uh, it, it, is that not something that you, you think should be supported? Oh, yeah, totally. But I think people have to be honest about it. Um, yeah. Because, again, uh, I'm a venture capitalist at heart. And uh, so the one thing I've learned over the years and the one thing I strongly feel and believe is that 99.9% .9 of uh, opportunities that are being offered for, for funding via ICO or crowdfunding for that matter are early stage ventures. Right, and then whether you then fund them the one or the other way, that's just a mechano. But the underlying uh, is a venture in its early stages, which will have to go through a phase of development. And you know, you have the beautiful hockey stick, and which is always true, by the way. And then usually you end up stretching the timeline a bit, uh, but the hockey stick stays. Uh, and there is a timeline to it. You know, there's the technical risk you need to uh, manage, or you need to develop the market you need to develop, and and so forth. Um, so you have to be realistic about that. Um, and, and whatever it is, that's what it is. But uh, don't try to sort of fall into wishful thinking because here it's not about just not achieving 
business plans. Here it's about potentially violating regulation. And then we're talking a whole different language, right? Yeah, and I know from uh, some of our previous interactions, uh, which I've enjoyed very much, uh, that, you know, we both agree that transparency is, is, is key to that. Um, yes. But because we're kind of... Uh, uh, kind of moving towards the end and we're going to run out of time soon. I, I just want to ask you a little bit about the UK um, and its place. Very recently, um, uh, the uh, blockchain all-party parliamentary group have published a report. And one of the things that said is that, you know, the UK is, uh, exact, I forget the exact words, but, you know, incredibly well-placed to take a position of leadership in the world. But... Actually, when we look at the report and we look around, we're not there yet. Um, how do you see, um, uh, uh, you know, how the land lies right now? And what are your, what are your thoughts about that sort of um, vision? <laughs> well, you know, predictions are very difficult, especially about the future. But, uh, in, and I also have to make a disclaimer, uh, everybody who knows me uh, knows how much I love the UK um, and, and everything that's going on there. Uh, I think the UK has been a thought leader in almost anything uh, ever in the history. So um, uh, I, I personally would put my money on the UK and that is for a number of reasons. Uh, and first of all, again, going back to innovation theory, which is, which is obviously one, one thing I'm really passionate about, is you don't always have to be the first mover. Um, in, in most cases, it's actually better to be a fast follower. Uh, and again, sometimes, uh, you know, the UK is not a speedboat. It's probably not the super tanker that, that our friends in the colonies are and so forth, but it's somewhere in between. Uh, and yes, now some of the weight is being cut off and so forth, uh, but nevertheless, it's not that easy to move, but it's still able to, to move rather fast and, and swiftly once it's, uh, it's decided to do so. But coming back to something I've said before, to ultimately be successful in this game and then you know if we look at sort of the midterm not not just the short term which we've seen so far it's again the combination of factors and the ico as such is um is, is a one-off event this is how you raise the funding but i believe the important thing is where you then do the development uh, of of the underlying technology which is the the really important thing and that will be done where those factors are combined in the best way uh, so where you will find the talent and where is the talent, you know? I mean, there is so much talent in just one street of London, but I've also been in Ireland and I've been in Scotland and, and I've been uh, in the middle of it all, you know, and I'm, I'm meeting talent and inspired people left, right and center. There is money, uh, you know, we have venture capital that is uh, getting into the ring. There is ultra high net with individuals, there's family offices, and there is increasingly uh, a sophisticated retail audience, which is getting behind that. So again, uh, that allows for many things. And there is an established industry, which you don't always have to disrupt, right? Which is a big theme, but you also can tap into, you can partner with and develop things. So I have every faith in the world that the UK will be a very, very important player uh, in this in this game. And, and lastly, uh, also the statistics are sometimes deceptive, right? Because they are sort of based, uh, you know, I'm, I'm again on, on a combination of factors, but um, usually around the domicile of the vehicle um, and and uh, or uh, the, the the key people behind it. But if you indeed look where those are, you know, you could also arrive at different classifications sometimes. And quite quite often we see key drivers. Uh, behind projects that are ICO funded either in the UK or closely linked to the UK and almost in all instances there is a link uh, to the UK. So they may not have been uh, uh, the front runners and uh, we should also bear in mind that there were other things to, uh, to busy oneself uh, in the past two, three years in the UK. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, but I believe that uh, we will see a continued uh, importance and, and rise of, of the UK. That's just me, personal view, yeah. and I'm biased in many a way, as I have declared. Yeah, yeah. I, I think, you know, what we see from our own data, we, as you know, token intelligence, we collect data, uh, about 2,500 crowdfunds so far. And uh, certainly in terms of domicile, um, the UK is way behind uh, at the back of the pack, uh, optimistically, possibly way behind the pack. Uh, yeah, but, but again, uh, again, I, I, again, I, I don't, don't, that's obviously not the whole story. No, 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 don't, don't let that confuse you, huh? I mean, just look at the asset management space for comparison. Uh, I mean, the main domiciles that would pop up here 
uh, Ireland and Luxembourg, for example, when we look at the retail fund space. Uh, but trust me, there is more asset managers uh, actually pushing the buttons and making the key decisions and getting the actual money uh, when we talk about the performance fee and management fee sitting in uh, one street in the city of London uh, than in all of those other hubs uh, together, right? So we have to di differentiate between the vehicles uh, and the actual brain power and the actual realization. Switzerland is a bit of a combination case because we have the crypto value, so we have the realization of the technology potential uh, that is triggered by the ICO funding and we have the ICO funding. Uh, but you don't need to have uh, both. And if I could choose, I probably rather would have the people and the result of the investments in my territory rather than the pure uh, issuing, which, you know, when we look at hedge funds for, for decades almost has been done on some islands and no disrespects to that. But, you know, the actual people always were in New York, San Francisco, Boston, London, Amsterdam, Berlin, Frankfurt, Zurich, wherever. So it's sort of the same kind of structure, I would, I would assume. Yeah, I don't, don't disagree with you, although I, I do suspect that our treasury would want both. Um, however, uh, time has just about defeated us. Because, uh, uh, just before we, we sort of close off for the end, uh, let me just ask you if there's one thing or one message people should take away or uh, one thing you'd like people to remember from this interview, what would that be? Yes, uh, there, there's actually two messages, if you permit. On the one hand, if you're thinking about pursuing an ICO for your innovation um, to, to get the funding for it, uh, be objective. There's many options now coming, uh, coming up where you can do that. Don't fall for the marketing. Uh, really look into the reality of it. Uh, compare because it's horses for courses. There may be different options which work in different situations. You've got to find the right one. And uh, it's like in, in many other instances. On the other hand, if you're thinking about investing in an ICO, treat it like a venture investment. Ask the critical questions and they're always the same. They're about the team, they're about the technology, they're about the business plan uh, and so forth. Don't just blindly um, you know, throw your money or crypto for that matter. Uh, at a white paper, you know, then you, you have no reason to be surprised uh, if things go wrong. Things still can be wrong because the risk profile is that of venture capital or even more. Uh, but just be critical and just use the gray matter which God has placed between your ears. Uh, and with that in mind, I think it's, it's exciting times. Uh, you know, we are seeing those exponential technologies uh, unfold twice in, in one generation's lifetime. The internet and blockchain, which I fundamentally believe will be just as transformative. Uh, so, so I believe for those who are so inclined, it's, it's exciting times. And so let's do amazing things together. Yeah, I, 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 it's, a, it's, a, it's a developing theme. And I think you're absolutely right that we are in exciting times uh, and as transformative as, as back there in the early days of, of the internet. But as I say, uh, we, could talk, we could talk on this much, much more. I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely certain, but time's defeated. So I have to say, uh, to thank you. Uh, for your for, for your time and your particip participation. Thank you for having me, Barry. And I, I look forward to the next report and to uh, further dialogue in the future. Same here. Thank you so much. Thank you. ICO Radio was brought to you by author, speaker, transparency and clarity advocate and award-winning software innovator, Barry James. Get in touch with the programme. Put yourself or someone else forward as a guest visit iconewsdesk.com. And if you've enjoyed the show, please leave a review. And don't forget to subscribe to get your next insights and interviews from the ICO Radio Podcast.